Hey everybody, John Wagnon here with Dev Central, and we are bringing you another Lightboard lesson video. And today we're going to tell a real attack story. Stories from our Silverline Security Operations Center. This is our managed security services uh, team that uh, does really great work with DDoS protection and web application firewall protection. Uh, so you can go check those guys out. Silverline Sock, they do great work. Um, but one of our customers uh, that we help protect is a financial financial institution, a bank, and it seems like banks get attacked a lot. You know, these attackers want to come after banks, whatever. Um, but uh, but over the course of probably about three weeks, uh, there was this attacker that kept sending DDoS attacks against this one bank, and um, and it was interesting because there there was like a specific time window that the attacker would uh, attack every single day. So. I don't know if it was like, hey, attacker gets up from bed and, you know, whatever is up for the day and attacks for about seven hours and then is kind of done attacking for the day, whatever. So, but it was kind of interesting to see even that time window that it's not just like all day, every day. It's, uh, it's very specific times during the day. But nonetheless, what happened was um, we've got the, uh, we've got our, our victim um, or, well, the, the victim of the attack was our, was this bank site. So we'll, uh, we'll call it. Uh, bank.com right here all right and this is the uh, this is the the target you know victim of all these attacks and of course you have uh, the Silverline um, DDoS protection services um, you know out here and this is our cloud-based protection services out here in front of the uh, the banking website uh, our customer um, and so any kind of requests that come into bank.com or you know whatever um, are going to come through Silverline and all of our protective services uh, before they can get there. So, so what would happen is this attacker launched a whole series of different attacks all at the same time um, and or used a number of different attacks. It, it, he didn't necessarily use every single one in his arsenal every single day, but over the course of time used a whole bunch of them kind of all at the same time. So um, anyway, so a few of them included tax, attacks like uh, an NTP uh, amplification, so I'll just put NTP amplification attack, and the way, the nature of the NTP amplification attack is such that you have an attacker who is targeting a victim, and the, what the attacker will do is, let's say that they have uh, control of like some kind of a, a botnet uh, out here, so I'll just say, uh, you know, attacker, um, attacker bot, let's say, and this bot, uh, or the attacker has control of all these different bots. So there's a whole bunch of different bots um, that they have control of. What they'll do is they will send a, an NTP request to an NTP server. Uh, so let's say they send it to this NTP server um, in the, to try to get this amplification attack going. Um, but the request that they send in uh, will have a spoofed IP address, and the spoofed IP address is the IP address of the target victim. And so, uh, so here's the request that comes in, but then as the response comes back from the NTP server, it goes to the victim. So this is the, uh, this is the response right here from uh, this request right here. All right, so that's the nature of kind of how these things work. The reason that it's an amplification attack is because the request, the nature of the request itself, is very, it's a very small request. Specifically, a lot of times on an NTP amplification attack, they, the, NT, the attacker will uh, take advantage of what's known as a monlist command on NTP. And basically what a monlist command does is it basically says, hey, NTP server, give me the last like 600 um, you know, entries that you have in your database or in your server or whatever. Um, and so the NTP server would say, okay, hey, here's like 600 uh, you know, entries. So it's a very small request, but it's a very large response. It's a, so it amplifies the response. Um, but if you do this over the course of several, you know, here's another NTP server here, and then here's another one here, kind of a thing, and you just keep sending all these requests, and then all the responses keep coming back to the victim, then it's going to create this large distributed denial of service attack. And that's precisely what happened here. Um, NTP, by the way, runs on uh, UDP port one, two, three. So, uh, so UDP is a connectionless protocol. Uh, it doesn't. It's kind of a you know fire and forget type thing. You know, send it, and, and you don't have to worry about a response and a connection set up and all that. It's just a connectionless um, you know protocol. 
Uh, so anyway, so you can just fire off all these requests and then they just uh, they flood the attacker. So that's what happened here with the NTP uh, amplification attack. While that's going on, though, you also have a DNS amplification attack. So here's DNS, and it's a, it, the same basic idea happens here. So you've got attacker out here, and the attacker sends a request to an open DNS server, and then they spoof the IP uh, address of the request so that the response comes back to, um, you know, here's the, here's the response, which is much larger than the request. Um, so the response goes to the target victim, right? Um, and so you can do this, you know, just say like dot, 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 whatever. There's all these different DNS open resolvers out there on the internet, and then they're just going to continue to all flood the, the uh, bank.com. Uh, DNS also runs on UDP, and so I'll say uh, UDP, and this is a port 53 is what DNS runs on. All right. Um, a lot of times what will happen here, like I said, on the NTP, they use the monlist uh, command, uh, which is, is a you know, much larger response compared to the request. DNS, there's a lot of things you can use there as well. You can send in a request for uh, what's called any, um, which basically says, hey, DNS resolver, uh, for this certain you know, DNS lookup, then you know, give me anything you possibly have on that, which essentially the DNS uh, you know, response to that or the response to that request is gonna be like, hey, here's everything I've got. Um, so the response is gonna be much larger than the request. Uh, ironically, people also use, uh, I'll, put, uh, I'll put it like right here, um, DNS sec, which, is which has been created to help secure the DNS system, the domain name system, um, but ironically, DNSSEC responses for a request get, can be very, very large. They've got different keys that go on in there, different security pieces of that request, um, or that's part of the response, I should say. So anyway, so ironically speaking, you can actually use the DNSSEC uh, you know, components of DNS to work in your favor if you're an attacker for DNS amplification attacks against a victim. So you've taken a secure feature that's built into DNS and you've used it to actually attack. So, uh, so kind of crazy stuff that goes on there. All right, another one that is happening at the same time is one that's called um, CLDAP, which is, this is connectionless LDAP, um, which is the lightweight directory access protocol uh, to look up like file, you know, traversal and all, all kinds of different uh, stuff, you know, that, that the LDAP protocol um, you know, uses, but CLDAP is the connectionless LDAP, which is another UDP, um, uh, you know, system. And this, this runs on uh, UDP port 389, all right? So a very similar thing, you have the attacker out here, um, which is in control of a big botnet or whatever. They're sending in LDAP request, or in this case, CLDAP request. And then the response, they've spoofed the IP address again, and the response is coming up here to bank.com. All right, so you've got all of these things happening, which by the way, they use some other ones as well, things like uh, send flood attacks, uh, reset flood um, attacks. Uh, there's uh, memcache amplification. We, we covered in, uh, memcache actually on uh, some other light boards. We can link to those. Uh, but, uh, but a lot of these are a very similar type um, you know, attack where you send, you have control of a botnet, you send in a small request, and then the response is this huge response and it just floods your, uh, your target victim. One other one that I was gonna mention too is, uh, is an, another attack that this attacker used um, was uh, using the IPsec, um, it's, it's an IPsec flood is basically what it was. So it was not an amplification attack specifically. I'll write it right up here. Um, IPsec flood, and on, uh, and on an IPsec flood, essentially what IPsec does is it creates a secure tunnel between two communicating systems. Um, so in this case, you've got the attacker out here who wants to use this as an attack vector against the victim. And what, uh, what, what happens on an IPsec tunnel, essentially, is you have two different phases of, of setting up this secure tunnel. 
So on phase one, you have one, uh, one system that requests you know, a secure tunnel into you know, the other system. And so uh, I'll just put, uh, I'll put phase, I'll put phase one right here, phase one. And during phase one, uh, you, you share some keys and you share some of the management level communication data that you need in order to then create uh, the phase two and the final phase of the actual tunnel itself where data is gonna be transferred. Um, so you think of it like, you know, hey, let's set up kind of the management level. How are we gonna do all this stuff? Once all that's in place and we've agreed on different keys and that kind of thing, all right, now we can start sending data in kind of an underlying tunnel or a, uh, or a tunnel inside the tunnel really is what it is. Uh, so phase one is kind of that initial setup and then that follows on to then phase two of the, uh, of the IPSEC you know, tunnel. And so what the way that the flood works is phase one, the phase one stuff, the attacker would send all the phase one data to the, the site and then the site would be like, okay, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna do this thing because this site does allow you know, IPSEC tunnels uh, or IPSEC you know, communication between these you know, two communicating hosts. Um, but what the attacker would do is they would set up the phase one stuff and then they would stop right there and they would, not, they would never go on. So phase two, uh, I'll just put a, like a X through that. Phase two, they would just never do that. And so what that does is it leaves the, the victim host here kind of, uh, you know, kind of st standing by like, hey man, I thought we were gonna do this thing, uh, but now you're not, you're not, you know, finishing the job as it were. So it just, they kind of sit there in limbo land, but it, but it starts to exhaust all their resources. Um, and they just have all these kind of half open connections as it were. And they're like, hey, what, what are we doing here? Um, so all of this stuff is going on all at the same time. The, uh, the attacks uh, themselves would be uh, typically, I'll put it right over here, uh, greater than 20 gigabits per second, um, you know, for any given, you know, remember those time intervals I talked about, uh, greater than 20 gigabits per second on each, you know, individual day that the attacks would happen and all that kind of stuff. Uh, some of the things that, they, that our SOC team would do to mitigate this stuff is uh, on the NTP and the DNS and the CLDAP and the memcache, some of that stuff, um, frankly, they would just close down the ports, like close down UDP port 123 uh, for any kind of external um, you know, NTP traffic. Because frankly, for your own application, you ought to have internally trusted NTP servers that you talk to to do all your timing protocol stuff. Um, so if you're looking to external NTP servers to give you timing information, then you know, don't do that. Um, so frankly, they would just shut down UDP port 123 and that would shut down the attack coming from NTP. Very similar here, uh, DNS, they, they could shut down UDP 53, although DNS is a little different animal. They, uh, they could do that, um, but also if you expected some DNS traffic from external uh, DNS servers, then what you could do is whitelist those and then shut down anything else beyond those whitelisted DNS servers. Um, which frankly, they have some other cool options. Our Silverline SOC team has some cool options on how to, how to make sure DNS requests and responses are coming to and from the right places. Um, so, uh, so you can talk to them about more of the, the really cool mitigation stuff for DNS attacks. Uh, CLDAP, uh, they shut down UDP port 389. That's one of those you probably don't really expect external um, you know, internet traffic from that specific port uh, number and that protocol. Uh, you know, so this is gonna be more of an internal kind of thing uh, anyway, so they could just shut that down. Uh, the IPsec flood stuff was kind of cool because they, they did some things uh, with some regex manipulation. Um, they would look at things like, hey, um, if, if the, uh, the phase one packets were sent, but then the phase two never really got established, then let's just shut down whatever that uh, source is that's trying to you know, hold open the phase one, but never complete uh, the phase two connection for, for the IPsec tunnel. Um, and then what they would also do is create a list of like the top offenders that were doing this, the IPsec flood stuff, and they would say, hey, these are all the bad guys that are like you know, trying to do this stuff, so let's just shut them down. Um, so anyway, so in all, they were able to respond to this whole host of craziness attack that came against the bank. Um, so, you know, in the end, the bank is still serving uh, requests and, you know, doing its thing for its customers. So, uh, you know, this kind of stuff happens all the time. 
uh, to, to, you know, tons and tons of sites out there on the internet. So if you have not been attacked yet, just wait, you know, it's probably coming. Um, so the story is that, you know, you still want to serve up legitimate requests to all your customers, but the truth also is you've got attackers out there that are just flooding you with all kinds of crazy stuff and you need something to, you know, to defend you against all of this madness, you know? So, uh, so if you don't have someone like Silverline, like a, you know, managed security services, or maybe you have your own team that does this, that's, that's good. You need to have something in place um, because this is the reality of the world we live in. So, uh, so hopefully you've enjoyed uh, hearing about this actual real life attack against one of our customers and how we were able to mitigate that and still, uh, still keep them up and running and their customers are still happy and frankly, we're none the wiser that all this craziness is going on in the background. So, uh, so good job, Silverline Sock. Uh, thanks for hanging in there with us today on this Lightboard lesson video. Hey, if you like this thing, you can click up here on our DC logo and subscribe to our YouTube channel and we'll see you guys out there in the community.